we would be honored if you would join us. All right, everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of Dungeon Crawlers, where obviously I'm back in the pilot seat. Uh, we got Krebs and Alton joining me this evening, and we are going to talk to you about something really awesome and exciting. It's been a while since we've talked uh, about gaming, and uh, well, all of us are gamers, and we thought it would be amazing to hold a GM seminar. Yeah, Hooray. sort of, except for you don't have to pay for it. You know, you don't have to pay you know, <laughs> three, four hundred dollars to go sit to someone gabbing and talking, and then in the middle of all that gabbing and talking, try to sell you on another package to continue on. To you know, or maybe we could do that. Maybe that maybe we, that's <laughs> given, maybe that is what we need to do. Uh, you know, for forty nine ninety nine, we can teach you too how to write your own adventure and how to trick your players into killing one another. No, just kidding, just kidding. We're we're gonna uh, give you the level one seminar, and between the time that we stop recording and the time that the episode uploads, we'll create the level two content, which you can then purchase from us in yes. easy <laughs> installments of a hundred dollars each. Yeah, of ninety nine, ninety five. This went from podcast to infomercial in like two I, seconds. I know. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, I mean, when I when you pitched the idea, you know, I, I I was just talking, I was thinking over my head, and that's just everything that kept happening. It just sounded like an infomercial. The GM seminar, only five episodes, nine ninety five each. Yeah, like yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> um, and if you're joining us way in the future and we've done future editions, then you know we didn't have everything to say. But right. uh, hopefully we'll at least get you started down this path. Well, no, I mean, it's really exciting. Uh, when I started the show years ago, well, I mean, over a decade ago. Yeah. I can actually say that now. Uh, we, we talked a lot about gaming. Gaming was a, a core unit of the show. Um, you know, when we when Joe and Flagoon and Malik left the show... Uh, Jared and Jessica joined, but they weren't really heavy gamers, so we kind of moved away from that. And uh, I, I've I've missed it. It's been something that has always been uh, part of my heart, uh, a part of this show that's been missing. And I'm glad to have it back because gaming is amazing and fun. We've already talked about it before. Um, so kind of having the GM seminar or DM seminar, whatever you want to call it, is awesome uh, because I mean. I'm sure m both of you have been asked, you know, Alton for a while ran a game store. Uh, Krebs has been a GM for many years, uh, probably as close to, to as many years as I have, because I know my uh, GMing experience uh, expands over decades, um, three at this point. Um, and people always ask, how do you get into GMing? How do you be a GM? Or, you know... This, this is really hard. How, how do you make it easier? Um, <laughs> so we're going to discuss those things. You know, and I love how Alton laughs because it really is not that hard. I don't know why people think it's this. Yeah, you have to have like this advanced degree. Maybe there's another there's another thing for us. You know, we for have to put the school of GM. Yeah, for one forty nine ninety nine. You can, too can get your diploma for the school of GM. Welcome I would... to role playing university. For anybody who is interested, I would be more than willing to sign a scrap of paper and mail it to you for $150. I, I will gladly do that every day of the week. But uh, if it's okay, do you mind if I start with my story of how I yeah, became go a ahead. GM? You know, yes, but l let's preface it with our credentials, if you will. Uh, Alton, uh, when did you first start playing role-playing games? How long have you been playing slash GMing? Uh, so I am the relative youngin of the group. Uh, I've been playing for 10 years and GMing for that time minus three weeks. Nice. Yeah. And, and is there a particular system? Like, what did you cut your teeth on? Where do you live now? Yeah. So, um, well, okay. So there is a technical theoretical space that was before that three week mark. Um, I, uh, I moved down to Florida for a number of weeks and as part of that started a game night with a whole bunch of guys. And, uh, we had two gentlemen, um, who had some, some mental issues that made it very difficult for them to be able to engage in game nights. But the rest of the guys all wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons or an RPG of some type. And, um, we pulled out the Descent board game, 
way back in the day there. Uh, and uh, at that point, the first edition version of the game, one player had to take the role of the evil overlord running all of the dungeons. Um, but I already had a fundamental understanding of what a role-playing game was, so I took all of the mechanics that were in Descent and reworked them so that we could create our own adventures. And I found uh, at that time there was a resource online that taught you how to build your own characters using their system. And so I systematized it so that we could bring it back and use very, very simple stats and simple dice, things that these guys were already able to, to understand and work with very easily to be able to start running those games. Um, and so I started to write my own adventures at that point. Um, but uh, it was, man, yeah. Uh, but it, it was, it was not technically GMing. Um, and for those of you who have never had the opportunity to be a GM or a DM dungeon master specifically refers to dungeons and dragons. It is a trademarked, uh, uh, trademark. It's a, it's a it's trademarked trademark word. term. Yeah. Yeah. By wizards of the coast. Um, GM stands for game master, which is the much more general term. And so the first actual role-playing game that I GM'd was Pathfinder. Um, showed up just down at my local game store, uh, saw that there were a group of guys getting ready to play and I'd asked around and they said, yeah, we think they've got room for one more. So I walked over to the table and they said, yeah, we need a cleric. And I'm like, sweet. How do I do that? And they handed me a book and said, here's your thing. And I'm like, okay, this doesn't help. <laughs> and so we, <laughs> we sat down and, uh, they helped me crunch through, find all of the basic things. And I built my character in that first session came back uh we played two sessions and then at the third the gm didn't show up and everybody looked at me and said well you've been pretty good at making things up so you run it and i said well i don't know the rules and they said well it, it's okay just you tell the story and we'll worry about the rules and so i did and since that point i have played in a total of nine campaigns I am about to start my 10th campaign as a player uh, in 10 years. And the rest of the time I've been GMing usually once to twice a month at a minimum. And I've been paid to GM for the last five years. So it's been a good time. Uh, That's and, amazing. You know, and, and it was one of those things where, again, like I, I really got thrust into the fire without knowing the rules um, it was my job just to do the best that I could to tell a good story and keep everybody engaged. And it's gone on to inform both the way that I GM any system, but also the way that I've written and designed my own systems and campaigns. Um, and, uh, yeah, if we've got time later on, I'll talk about the golden, silver and bronze rules of storytelling, uh, that <laughs> I've come up with as a result of that, but I don't want to jump ahead and give, uh, advice before we talk about pedigree. So, uh, Krebs, what was it for you? What, what got you into playing role-playing games? Um, I, I always have to dig into my memory a little bit. I, uh, I, I think we haven't really talked to numbers, but I'm pretty sure, uh, on a calendar, I'm older than Elton, but not, I, I'm just slightly, I think I'm like one year behind Daniel. Um, the first role-playing game I remember playing was the Marvel role-playing game that was loosely based on what was then the D&D uh, system. I think it was probably D&D &D, uh, second edition or third maybe. But we're talking like early, early years. So this was when I was about... Um, I, th I don't even think I was eight years old yet. I think I was closer to like six or seven. And my older brother had this game. And uh, he let me play all of the X-Men. Like all of them. <laughs> and we were fighting, we were fighting Doc Ock and like, it was just this wonderful Marvel crossover. Um, and that's what really trained me in the ways of the RPG, if you will. And we only played once or twice. We didn't play that many times, maybe, maybe three times tops. Um, and that was, that was over 35 years ago. And, um, and then years, many years later, um, as a, as a preteen, I was, introduced to formal D and D, which I fell in love with, uh, immediately. And then I used that. I, I liked it so much. I wanted to play it with my friends, but I didn't have any of the books and I wasn't in a position to purchase them. So I came up with what we termed mock D and D, which was just our understanding of the rules, um, rules that we had injected. We played completely without books and sometimes we would play with paper characters and sometimes we would not. And we would just play the game. And I was often the, the DM at that point. In fact, I think I was always the DM at that point, with very rare exception. 
And then as a paper boy, I, this is like, you know, this is obviously like at the turn where the internet begins to show up in houses, but not quite. So newspapers yeah, like were still very years much a thing. Ago? I know, 60 right? Years ago? Years, when I was your age, um, <laughs> I I had a, a straight up bicycle paper route, and at that time, uh, X Men twenty ninety nine had come out in the in the comic world, and it's the only comic series I collected, beginning to end, and in every one of those comics, there was an advertisement for Kevin uh, Shimbiata's uh, Palladium game Rifts. And uh, if you've been following Dungeon Crawlers for the last 10 years, then you might maybe possibly recall the episode where Dan and I first met and I was there evangelizing the uh, the the pros and cons of the Palladium system. But I went off for, you know, an hour and a half on that. And so um, I, I used my Paperboy money to buy the core book, my first set of dice that were purely mine, and um, I think a couple of the source books. And it started an entire love affair with tabletop RPGs. I would end up being a GM pretty consistently uh, as, as a, in my youth and then off and on as an adult for the next uh, 27 years. So I've got roughly, if we combine all of it together, I have something in the neighborhood of 30 years of RPG experience, both as a GM and as a player, mostly as a GM. Cool. What and, about for you? Oops, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I was actually going to hand it over to Daniel. Uh, Daniel, what are your, what, what's your pedigree? What's your RPG pedigree? Oh, hang, hang on. need to unmute your, there, buddy. Mike is muted. Ha! There it is. Let's see. Um, oh, man. I, yeah, it, it's awesome being able to record at home in, in my little studio, but you know, when you hear a kid cry, you're like, oh, crap. You had to, to run off. But anyways, to the point of the question, my pedigree. Um, I have been gaming for 30 years. Uh, I started when I was 12. Um, not really realizing I was gaming at the time. Uh, there were several... Uh, what? The, the Marvel one, I played that back in the day. Uh, I even mm -hmm. still have the original books. Um, they are beat up. They are near destroyed, but I picked that <laughs> up at a local comic book shop thinking, hey, this is a cool comic. No, it was a game system. Um, read through it. I'm like, hey, this could be a cool game. Played it a little bit. Uh, from there, uh, I did the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle one way back in the day. Um so those are the ones I cut my teeth on. Uh, the looking back, we played that horribly, horribly wrong. Um, <laughs> it literally was, "Hey, this guy's attacking you," and we rolled the dice and we're like, "I, th my my number's higher than yours. I win." Uh, type situation. We really didn't understand the rules. Um, then fast forwarding, uh, I got into GURPS mm -hmm. uh, with some friends. Uh, then riffs. Uh, eventually, we moved into really, really, uh, really light version of uh, second edition D and D uh, playing. Uh, I had a friend that really loved Dragonlance, and this is where I got into Dragonlance. Um, he was the GM, and he sucked at it. I'm not going to say his name because he sucked at it. I mean. It was <laughs> Um, you know, I wanted to be this, I wanted to be a wizard. So I picked a wizard. I thought wizards were cool. And I didn't realize that wizards in D and D suck in the beginning. I mean, you are pretty much the equivalent of a sheet of paper. Everything can punch a hole in you. Um, and so I'm playing and we get surrounded by this group of military guys. And, you know, I can kind of, he has this dungeon master screen. I, I can unfortunately kind of see. And, you know, he just went through the whole process of explaining that ones are critical misses, 20s are critical hits. It's awesome. And I watched him roll like five ones, but he still <laughs> hits me. He still hits me. <laughs> and I'm like, what the crap? I'm like, okay, maybe he's got some modifier or whatever. I'm just going to go with this. 
And then I roll, and I roll a critical hit. And he's like, yeah, you miss. I'm like, what? Uh, needless to say, I never played with him again after that. Uh, I did start reading the Dragonlance novel, so I'll appreciate that from him. I went out. I went to Media Play. That's how old uh, this media was. Media Play. <laughs> wow. Oh my I have gosh. forgotten about Media Play until and this I moment. Picked up, about that. Yeah, I picked up the Player's Guide, the Dungeon Master Guide, and the Monster Manual. Um, that my, was this still are, second edition, or was it third edition? It was second point? edition. It was second edition. They're the only uh, gaming books that I own that I have had to tape back together because <laughs> I have used them so much. Uh, all my other books are like in pristine condition. The backs aren't broken, or the spine isn't broken, and, and so on and so forth, uh, except for those books. However, I have bought new copies uh, since. But anyway, so that's where I started. I've gone through third edition, 3.5. Uh, the I've also played the the edition that will not be named. Um, I, be <laughs> I beta tested fifth edition uh, with Wizards, which was really awesome. Um, and got to be a part of that, which was cool. And I know a lot of other, you know, they kind of did it wide, widespread, but before they did that, I was part of that uh, uh, just because I had kind of this really cool relationship with them because they've been on the show so many times. Um, I've been able to speak on panels because of it. I have ran celebrity games, which has been awesome. You know, uh, it's always cool when you can claim that you have had certain individuals play in your game and or get pulled out of the middle of Comic-Con and say, hey, my buddy has never played before, um, and you need to run a game tonight. And I have, like, three New York Times bestselling authors sitting in, in it. You know, <laughs> this is before I even started writing. And it's just, like, that's really intimidating. Uh, you have to tell a story yeah. to a group of professional expert storytellers. Well, and not only that, I've had no time to plan it, so I'm just winging it. Yeah. Uh, you walk into a tavern. There are giant rats in the basement. No, uh, I mean, that one was awesome because we did the Firefly setting. Um, mm. And I had all the rule books from Margaret uh, Weiss and that. Uh, and it was one of the coolest games I've ever ran. Uh, to this day, people still talk about it. Um, I uh, totally, completely obliterated one of the players at the very end. Because, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, he... It was his fault. You know, in the, in the realm of Firefly and Serenity, we have the Reavers. And this one author's son was playing with us. And he was an excellent sniper. And he picked off these guys, these people, you know, because they were trying to save these kids. And he was picking off these people that stole, kidnapped these kids. And then he decided he wanted to skin them and wear their skins. Whole. Oh. I know, it kind of went dark. But he, it gets to the point, they've saved him. There's this huge posse that rides in, and he's coming up, to, he's coming up the, the hillside. He's in his skin suits. It, you know, he's wearing multiple Edgar suits. <laughs> and in, he's you know, in and, his skin suit. And he rolls four different ones <laughs> on his sneak check. And so I'm just like, <laughs> oh someone... God. In the posse, turns and yells, Reaver! And everyone opens fire. The kid's dead. Um, yeah. Well, so you it's, are what you wear. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, but, it's, but that's one of the fun things about yes. games, right? Especially role-playing games is that, um, and this is something that I've had to tell people too, is they're like, well, what if things don't go right? And it's like, well, if the story went perfectly right, you would start in the town, receive the quest from the shopkeeper, and go to the other town without incident and drop off the thing. And then the story would end and that would be yeah. all, right? But it's yeah, like these, right. these moments of extreme elation success and these moments of extreme ridiculous failure yeah. that start to add a lot of the texture and a lot of the things that really make these types of game fun. Well, and so absolutely. that, you know, and, 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 but there was very much to your point, there are still times where it's kind of rough to be in particular games, um, GMs or DMs who don't really... Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, finish your thought. Uh, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. No, uh, GMs or DMs who, who don't really take the time to understand that, you know, they're facilitating a game, helping players to tell the story, and instead want to dictate whether or not something is possible and whether or not the story can progress appropriately. Yeah. Now, uh, before we get too deep into it, because 
Uh, unbeknownst to many of the audience members, we have already just organically hit several points that are extremely important to the average GM. So let's roll it back just for a moment. Um, and, and we've expressed our pedigree. Great. Okay. Now, um, I'm certain that as a GM, at some point, you have each been asked, and I know that I've been asked, how do you get started? How, you know, what are some tips and tricks and things like that, right? Which I, I always use that phrase um, sort of uh, humorously, yeah. but the, the the question really is, how do you become a good GM? Um, so uh, let's talk about how you got started. How did you actually get started as a GM? Where did you begin? How did you actually get into that role? Elton kind of touched on his story for a moment. Well, and I think so I did too. Yeah, I um, think you did too. Yeah, it was easily, guy sucked. I decided I can do it better. And I got the books. I read what I needed to, and I did it. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a game. Really, it's as simple as that. Just deciding to do it. And you're going to mess up. I mean, the whole, I mean, with anything, it takes practice. The first time out of the shoot is going to be rough. It's not going to be perfect, and that's okay. So yeah. let's rephrase the question, because I think we've all kind of touched on our origins a little bit. Um, how does one who is interested in becoming a GM, where do they start? Where do they begin? So one of the biggest things, in my opinion, is is start by telling the stories that you love, right? A lot of people, even especially in classic D&D, spent a lot of time using The Lord of the Rings or Dune or, you know, all of these different areas as, as source materials to start to tell their own stories and explore portions of those universes that were interesting. Um, and that's one of the biggest things, you know, for me is, is especially when I was starting out and that first week where I was just supposed to make something up, I really just went back to even as simple as like the childhood formulaic picture book model where it's like this thing happens and then we know that there's some form of conflict and then the heroes have to fight against it and then we watch what happens from there, right? But you start to see uh, the, the first number of, of sessions that you sit down to really create something I found that I was starting to play the tropes out in my head because those were the things that players were very familiar with. And it was very easy for me to move from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And then you start to mix it up and you say, okay, how do we subvert those tropes? And it slowly, you begin to develop your own voice as a storyteller. And in those moments, you begin to become more reactive to what your players are doing instead of trying to force something upon them. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, for me, uh, the way that we got started, I think, and I think this also reflects a bit of, of Daniel's origin story. Um, I think it is a great place to begin to be a player first and just play at least one game. If you have that option, go to your local game store. There are often RPG nights and you would be surprised at how welcoming and open most RPG groups will be. There's a difference between a long-standing campaign and what we call a one-off. And you can often get into either early campaigns or one-offs as a temporary character uh, just to get your feet wet, especially if you express a desire to learn how these things work. And it should also be known that playing game X does not preclude you from being a GM in game Y. Yeah. You can start with any system because every RPG is built around the same core pillars. It's just the system that changes. Yeah. So I would say play a game at least once, maybe a couple times. Then, much like what I love what Alton said, you don't have to start with completely foreign material. You can start with stories you know or settings you're familiar with or at least a genre. You should always pick a genre that piques your fancy, right? So pick up uh, the traditional, the, the current edition of D&D &D if you're into sword and sorcery or if you're into high tech, look at Robotech or if you're looking for an amalgam, look at Rifts or Zombie Apocalypse. They have multiple zombie games, Dead Rain, uh, Our Apocalypse and a few others that are out there. Army of um, Darkness. Army of Darkness. <laughs> Um, but find like, like go to the store, look at the core books or even look at Amazon online and look at the core books and figure out which setting matches who you are as a fan. Yeah. There are Harry, there's Harry Potter. I just bought a whole bundle of Lord of the Rings, uh, RPG books off of humble bundle and so on. And then, and then, uh, I, I have some suggestions for where to begin once you have those, but that's how I would get my foot in the door as a GM. 
Well, no, I mean, definitely playing the game does help. Uh, you kind of can get a feel of how it should go for a player. Um, you know, but at the same time, starting out as a GM is okay too. You know, you just need yes, to kind of have a basic grasp of the mechanics. Um, and I think you hit it right. You know, once you played one, you can play them all. You know, it's like, you know, if, if you played a game on PlayStation, you can pretty much go to an Xbox One and figure it out. It's not that difficult. Your guy's running around on the screen. It's just you got to figure out which buttons you're pushing in, instead. And it's the same way with the other games. It's okay, what dice do what and so on and so forth. You know, you have some games, you're only rolling D6s. You never touch anything else. Some, uh, you know, with uh, D&D, you're using several different dice depending on what weapon. It's either D10 or a 12 or an 8 or whatever. Um, you know, uh, there's a couple of other games where you have specialized D8s. Uh, so it's really cool uh, with the variety that you have out there. You know, I remember back in the day when I first started where you couldn't go to a game store really to play games. You went there, got your games, got out. You know, you didn't hang out at game stores. That's true. You played in your basement. You played at your friend's house. You didn't advertise. You played. The culture now is different. You know, it's it's unusual if you don't know, which is awesome. Um, and, and that's great. Um, you know, and when you're... When you're starting out, be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with your characters. You know, don't write some vast epic, you know, adventure that's going to last for three, four years. Play an adventure, just one. You know, pick up a module. I mean, there's plenty out there that are written, and run that so that you have the mechanic. You kind of see how that flows. Um, you know, source material is great. When I started out, man, a lot of my stuff was very uh, Forgotten Realms. It had a, a flavor of Forgotten Realms, a little bit of Dragonlance, a little bit of Shannara. I mean, you name it, it was probably in there. Um, that sounds while epic. You, yeah, but while you're doing that, pay attention to what your players are doing and saying. That was the one, probably the greatest thing that I learned, is my players left little breadcrumbs and gems for me that I could later use. They never realized they were doing it. Uh, one example, I I had one player that was on, it was on, he was on guard duty for the night, and I brought this this thief that was going to come in and steal this magical item they had. That's his only job was to come in, steal it, disappear, and then you know they'd have to go find out what happened because he would have the you know it it wasn't part of the story to have this thief in there, so. The guy ends up catching the thief. He, he rolled a, per, a perfect 20. There's no way around this. And, and I'm one of those GMs where it's like, okay, I'm not going to screw my players over. He rolled a 20. He obviously caught him. And then my, the player did the thing I least expected. I thought he was going to yell for the other guys to wake up and attack the thief. Instead, he had a conversation with this thief and told the thief their entire plan, what they were going to do. <laughs> why they had the magical item, what they were going to do with it, where they were going, and so on and so forth. And I love my player that, that played this character because he literally had an intelligence of seven. He was playing <laughs> his character. He wasn't a bright character. He was super strong. He was very dexterous. In a fight, he was a guy to, to, to rely on. But when it came to brains, he just wasn't there. And so he told him this whole story. I took that you know, that thief that was supposed to be a nobody. And that thief antagonized that group for the rest of the campaign. The rest of the two years we played um, to, and up to completion, that thief was constantly at their heels after uh, the other magical items they were after. And, you know, it was amazing. And then, you know, there was a point where it was like, he's just like, you know, I'm, I'm playing for the wrong side. The guy that is my boss is like the biggest, evilest douchebag in the world. So I want to go freelance. I want, you know, I want to take a part of my own. So I'm going to step aside and let you go after him. And all my guys were like, what? We were waiting for this fight. He's been bugging us. And he, he steps aside and he's like, have a great time. And then vanishes. It, like, it irritated him so much, but. It was like the perfect way to get rid of that character 
but at the same time have this annoyance. It had nagged them the whole time, and they were ready for this fight. And then he was gone. Um, and then the same group, we played a different batch of characters that returned to the same world a few years later after this big event. That character had was now like the ruler of this vast city. He had conquered it with using his wiles and stuff like that. And every one of those players said, you've got to be effing kidding me. <laughs> because they knew who he was. But they couldn't, you know, th- their characters didn't know who he was. And so they had to act that out. Man, you could, you could see them trying to push those characters to, to, to be more like their other characters. But, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's something like that. It, it, the character had enough that, that NPC was not going to be anything. And now he became this integral part of this world I created. So when you're playing with your characters uh, and your other players, be aware of those things because you can have some real fun because they can definitely leave you gems to work with. Uh, Even when they do their backstories, there could be things in those backstories that you could use. Yeah, Uh, It can be fantastic. Well, and that was a big piece of, of my journey as well was starting to learn a lot of those things. Um, you know, the very first two sessions that I played, which is the reason that my GM ultimately left, he was having us go through these hallways and literally every door was trapped and literally every hallway was trapped. And so we weren't actually doing anything to propel the story. We were just disarming traps for four hours, two sessions in a row. And (laughs) first off, not every session needs to be four hours, but if you are going to play that long, maybe try to do more than one thing. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so, you know, when 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 he left and I had to take things over, you know, I like I said, I stumbled through as I was using tropes and trying to propel the story in particular ways. And I felt like I was constantly trying to push my players into the next thing. Right. Um, and it it took me a long time to figure out that instead we're 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 not even pushing or pulling. We're we're building the mm-hmm. world. We're building the ambiance. We're building the opportunities, and then allowing the players to propel the story. And ultimately, that led me to you know my gold, silver, and bronze rules of storytelling. The golden rule of storytelling is: it is the storyteller's job to ensure the players have a good time. Your job is not to tell the story. Your job is not to enforce every rule or cause every single event and problem and everything else. Your job is to ensure that the players have a good time. And so if you have a group of players who are not puzzle solvers, maybe don't put a puzzle in front of them. If you have a group of players who really just want to role play, really take the time to brush up on your soliloquy, right? The silver <laughs> rule of the silver rule of storytelling um, is that the storyteller will bend and or break the rules as necessary to ensure that the players have a good time. And this is, again, going back to what you guys have been saying about, like, just because you started in one system doesn't mean you can't run other systems, right? Very regularly, DMs will roll dice behind the screen in a way that nobody else can see what's going on. They won't tell the players why. You just roll the dice, see what happens. And similarly, as we go to resolve things, oftentimes I'll fudge the numbers. I'll go a little higher, a little low to make sure that the players succeed or fail if necessary, so long as it adds to the story and helps them to have a better time. Um, another one that we hear a lot about it that kind of falls under this is the rule of cool, which is that if it's going to be cool, if it's going to be epic, whether that's an epic success or an epic failure, Take the time to explore that moment. Don't feel like you have to rush on to the next thing or that you won't let a player do it just because it wouldn't normally fall under the rules or it's not realistic. You know, take the time and let that scene be set up. And then the bronze rule of storytelling, which is the one that is very important despite the fact that it is the third on the list. If the players are telling a better story than the one that's been told, tell that story instead. A lot of times we spend hours and days and weeks thinking up this grand plan and how we're (laughs) going to bring the characters down this path and then they're going to fight the boss and then they're going to find the thing and then they're going to go on to victory, right? And so we set up all of these traps along the way and then we build this really cool cave and the players are walking out towards it and they look at it and one of them goes, well, I'm afraid of the dark. And then the rest of the party goes, oh, well, In that case, there's a town up there. Let's go that way. And you've just spent weeks preparing this cave. But at the end of the day, if the story that the players are wanting to tell is cooler, it's much better to tell that story. Because even though at the end of the day, we act as arbitrators of the rules 
and you know storytellers for the purposes of constructing the framework the story is a collaborative process between not only you and the dice but each player at the table in the way that they want to explore those worlds those are excellent rules. Uh, those are fantastic. I think that um, young GMs, meaning in the sense of being new to being a GM, uh, young GMs, uh, because they're so scared to go outside the rules, you know, you've got this game system. It is, it is obvious. It's been, in the case of D&D, it's been around for five decades or it's, or, you know, many of these games are, are, are well-developed, tested and balanced. And so they have this innate fear of going outside those lines. And uh, what you said, combined with what Daniel said earlier, you should be crafting the story that fits your players. And you should, and in truth, in truth, every experienced GM realizes that the players are the ones telling the story. The GM is just adjudicating and, and finding the fun, right? That's really what the GM is doing. Um <clears throat> Daniel said something to the effect of, you're going to get it wrong. Sometimes you're going to get it right. And I would like to qual to qualify that and say that some of your games are not going to be fun. And some of your games are going to be freaking epic. And if you've known anyone who's a role player, you know that they cannot help themselves but tell you their stories and, and share their experiences as if, because it's a role playing experience, they will share the story as if. They were there at the crack of doom trying to throw the ring into the into Mordor, right? Or I'm sorry, into Mordor, into, uh, into the heart of Mount Doom. They weren't there. They didn't fight orcs, but they will tell the story in the first person because it's a role-playing experience. And they experienced it for the character. And the other funny thing about that, I know it was a bit of a gaffe on your part, but I have had plenty of adventures where we thought that we were setting out to bring the ring all the way to the crack of Mount Doom. And instead, <laughs> they stood at the edge and threw it in and just hoped it that it would work out, right? <laughs> These types of things that we can't anticipate our players doing because we imagine a story in our heads, but they're all imagining the story from their perspectives, too, and oftentimes see cool, innovative, unusual solutions or side quests or stories that deserve to be told as well. Well, Absolutely. I mean, and, and, as a G and, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, uh, no problem. Uh, I was going to say, as GMs, we pretty much manage chaos. I mean, we, we develop this story, but that story... And I used to spend hours. I would spend hours upon hours building these thick, massive adventures. Like, I thought of every detail. And I quit doing that. Like, I started just doing basic plot points. I want to hit this, this, and that. Because your players are going to... They, they are the chaos element in your story. Um, you are the narrator. You are narrating the story. And you're right. It is their story. It's their adventure. And... You don't know what they're going to do. I mean, even if you really know someone, you don't know what they're going to do. And so if you can let go of the control and just enjoy the ride and the experience uh, with them, it's going to be fun. Um, you know, there's a, a Dork Tower comic from years and years, well, decades ago at this point, that I always loved. You know, you have the adventurers, you know, listing off. But, you know, you stole the dragon's hoard. You... You defeated the warlord, and you go and, and you lift off all these thirty different amazing, fantastic, brilliant things that this adventure group has done, and they're like, "Yeah, we did this. this it was great. We did this." And, and the GM just looks at him, but you forgot to save the princess, you know, because that was the original adventure, and they took this, they they sidetracked and did all these other things, and and that's what's going to happen, you know. Sometimes they don't, uh, but at the same time. There has to be consequences. There has to be things that happen because the world is still going to evolve and revolve around them when they, they go off. You know, if they're supposed to go save the princess, but they decide to go after the, the troll and his mighty horde that has a magical artifact, well, maybe the princess dies. And then this war breaks out or whatever. There still has to be consequences for actions. Um, that's one thing I always implemented in my game. But yeah, again, ultimately, it still is their story and just let them have fun. And if they're having fun and you let go of that control, I guarantee you, you're going to have fun. Yeah. It really is a beautiful thing when people come together to share imagination and tell a joint story. 
And um, it, it, the other thing that, you know, we, we often put a lot of pressure on ourselves to tell the perfect story um, or to create the perfect dungeon, the perfect puzzle, the perfect campaign. And it's important to remember that we love stories because they're personal to us. And that's going to be a very similar experience for each and every one of your players. And the little piece of not nothingness that you wrote, that little one liner that you gave to one of your NPCs or the description of the sunset as they're walking through the valley. Some of those moments are going to be important to those players too. And it may not be the ones that you're expecting. It could just be you fumbling, trying to, you know, roll an extra die or think through something in your head before you move on to the next point that may be the springboard that enables those players to find increased enjoyment. And so we shouldn't be afraid to quote unquote miss the mark uh, because we create more opportunities for ourselves just like our players do in the game when they roll a one instead of a 20, right? Right. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, things that someone should do to be a good GM. And we've, we've actually, if you've listened carefully to the podcast and if you listen to it a few times, download it, share it with your friends. Um, if you listen to it a few times, you'll hear that we make several of these points and tips just kind of organically in our conversation. Yeah. Let's take a moment and let's highlight a key thing a GM should avoid. What is one common mistake that you have seen either in yourself or other GMs in your years of playing? I'll go first. Um, forcing your players to follow your storyline. That is the worst thing ever. Um, because one, it's not going to be fun because you're controlling the situation. And if you've ever been in a situation where someone is trying to control you, you hate it. You buck. You rebel. It's a surefire way to upset your players. They're not going to go the way you want. They're going to rebel. They're going to find any way to break away and do what they want. You know, it, it's There's still a way to bait them and move them along your storyline in an organic way that doesn't feel like, oh, yeah, you have to go through that door. There's seven doors in front of you, but you can only go through the green door. You know, I want to go through the blue door because that looks cool. That's my favorite color. No, you have to go through the green door. Yeah. Uh, as, you know, and that's what originally started me uh, GMing is, you know, that one player. He told me the rules. You know, critical hit to 20. That's a massive hit. I rolled a 20. Oh, no, nope, you missed. What? You just contradicted your own, you know, because it didn't go with his story. Uh, def that, that just irritates uh, anyone. I don't know anyone that doesn't like that. Or, or excuse me, that does like that. Everyone doesn't like that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, for for me, one of the big things that um, I I had to learn myself, and that I've also had to help a lot of other GMs and players learn, uh, is uh, to to avoid losing your sense of self and your sense of morals as you play, um, especially. Like, you know, many, many people have heard the horror stories, right, of a group of lecherous old men sitting around playing D&D &D, and the one girl who pulls up to the table to try to learn ends up getting scared away because they're over sexualizing everything or bringing things to an uncomfortable space. We also hear horror stories of players who try to do a pure evil campaign and really force things down a path that doesn't follow. Um kind of the, the things that we do want to engender in ourselves and others. And that's not to say that there aren't opportunities to pursue more mature themes or to explore those pieces of ourselves. Um, but it's also very important that, you know, you as the GM are a participant in what's going on and each of your players are participants as well. And it's important to be a guardian of that experience. Tracy Hickman tells a story of um, moving into a new neighborhood with his kids and his youngest son uh, found out that some of the neighbor boys liked to play D&D. &D. And so he invited everybody over to, to have a good night and try to explore, right? And Tracy sat down and started to run Ravenloft for them. And as they first <laughs> got into the town, it's like five minutes, 10 minutes into the adventure. Uh, one of the neighborhood boys says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to run up and I'm just going to bludgeon in the head of one of the women. Right. Uh -huh. And, Tracy says, okay, go ahead, roll it. And so the kid rolls it and he scores a hit. Tracy says, yep, sure enough, you killed the woman. And then the entire town rises up around you and grinds you into the dust, closes the book and walks away. <laughs> right? 
and and they geared up to do like a five hour you know yeah. play through Lavenloft with the creator but at the end of the day it was important to him that his morals weren't compromised for the yeah. sake of pursuing the wanton lusts of adventurers who were unwilling to participate uh, it's a group exercise and it's important that you and all of your players feel very comfortable with what's going on. And it is okay to end early or change the subject or pull somebody aside, you know, and, and to do so in a kind and loving way, but nevertheless be firm and, and resolute in the fact that there are things that it's okay. We don't have to go through. Well, and, and I think that's, that's a great point because uh, there's been multiple times I've played get, run games for my kids and their friends. And you have that one kid, that does something really stupid like that. And to end it like that, they get to see, oh, wow, there are consequences for my actions, even in this game. If I'm being stupid or I'm doing something that's heinously horrible, something's going to happen. You know, video games, you, you kind of don't have that. You know, if, you know there's, well, I mean, Grand Theft Auto, a great example. You get to run around shooting people and killing them left and right. No big deal. You know, the police chase you for a little bit and then they, they, they stop. But in that instance, you know, Ravenloft, I mean, that's a really evil world. People don't put up with that crap. And, you know, he put it, he did it. Game was over because he made a, a stupid move. I bet you that kid has never done that again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know. I mean, just playing Killer Breakfast that Tracy does, you have moments. You have like a moment, a fraction of a moment to think of something amazing to stay alive in that game. And there have been times where I've thought, oh man, this is really cool. I say it. And it's like, okay, you're dead now. And it's like, what? You know, and then you get down and you're like, oh man, yeah, I did something really bonehead there. Of course I see why I died now. And then you hope and pray that you'll get another chance to go up there again. You know, and it may be a year or two later, but you, know, <laughs> it, you learn from those experiences. And that's the great thing about being you know being a gm being a player you you learn from these experiences whether they're good whether they're bad whether they're epic amazing moments or they're epic failures they're always fun to have at the, the game table you will talk about them forever and you'll learn from them and you get to be social that's the one thing about role playing that is in, in my mind vastly important you're sitting at a table with a group of people you can see them it's not like you are separated from time by time and space. You are sitting across the table. You are interacting, and if you do something bonehead, they're going to they're going to say something back to you. Um, but generally, you work as a team to accomplish this goal, and it builds camaraderie. It builds uh, you know it bonds you, uh, and it really allows a portion of you to be creative when in sometimes we're not allowed to. Absolutely. Um, my admonishment would be, I, I realize what I'm about to say is extremely similar to what's already been said, and I, I'd like to phrase it a certain way. Um, playing a role-playing game ceases to be fun the moment that it becomes the GM versus the players. Uh, I, I've had too many situations where the players were trying to outplay the GM and the GM was trying to out GM the players. And it simply becomes caustic and dysfunctional and just a, a terribly negative experience for everyone. And this is reflected directly in Daniel's story of the GM who broke critical and botched rules to get the outcome that he wanted. As you told that story, my brain said, like my analysis was, he was he was trying to win the game mm -hmm. as the GM. He was trying to win, and he didn't want to lose to a new player. And that is a toxic, disgusting, vile mindset for a GM to have. Because of all the positive things that we said earlier about, I, I love what you said, and you both said this, but I love the, the verbiage that Daniel said of uh, a GM is managing uh, chaos. You're managing chaos. As I thought about it, I thought there's actually three there's there's three flavors of that, right? A GM is managing chaos, a GM is managing chance, and a GM is managing divine intervention. Yeah. All of this, all of this in conjunction with the fantastic gold and silver and bronze rules of storytelling. 
if you combine those things together, if you really adhere to those, you realize that if the GM is trying to defeat the players, if the GM is trying to beat the players, they've just defeated the purpose of their of their position in the game. And yeah. if the players are trying to outplay the GM, that is a bad, bad mental emo- motive, right? It's a bad yeah. motive for the players to have. It shouldn't be about beating the GM. The GM and the players should be working together to tell the story. And in order for a game to be fun, there must always be jeopardy, but there must always be some avenue for success until you make certain, as you put it, boneheaded decisions that lead you to a point where there just are no options left, right? Um, So yeah, I would say as a GM, don't beat the players, facilitate the players. And as a player, don't defeat the GM, play with the GM. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, the GM is is your best friend in the game, really. Well, he, a good GM is your best yeah. friend. I mean, he is the guide. He, you know, and, and more often than not, you know, a GM will like, you know, they'll throw you a bone, or you know, if you've rolled a bad roll, hey, roll it again. You know, a good GM will be nice. It's more about the story and having fun. It's not about ooh, I'm going to destroy my players tonight. I'm going to kill every one of them. It's going to be a total party kill tonight. And it's yeah. not about, hey, we're going to team up against the GM and we're going to wreck his story. No, it's all about having fun. And as long as you have that in mind, that you are, you know, the GM and the players are working together cohesively to, for, to have fun and develop this amazing story in this world, you, you've hit gold. It doesn't matter if you've flubbed up rules. It doesn't matter if you forgot a rule. It doesn't matter if you messed up roles. All that matters is you have created an epic story that you guys have enjoyed, you've had fun with, and you have memories at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think back to a lot of my early memories of of learning how to play because one of the big trepidations for me coming onto a role playing game was that, you know, I hear stories of people playing all night for six or eight or ten or twelve hours and holding campaigns that go on for years, right? And that was an unfathomable thing to me. Um, but I was willing to do a two hour session, a four hour session, just to sink my teeth in and see if I could understand what was going on. And even as I started to play and as I started to GM, I still didn't really understand the appeal for that type of thing until I'd been, uh, GMing for maybe two years or so. And I got invited to go play with a veteran group of gamers. Um, and we sat down and we built characters and it was fun. And then we finally sat down to play. And I just had such a fantastic time. And then all of a sudden I realized that I was like yawning and struggling to keep my eyes open. And I looked down and it had been eight hours. <laughs> and and it was in that moment that I realized like, okay, it's not because we're always necessarily sitting down and planning to do this thing. But as long as it's fun, like that's that's a beautiful experience to have. And as I sat back and, and I thought about what got us there, it's expressly what we've been com- getting through up to this point is that it's like everybody at the table, the GM, the players, everybody was pulling weight and helping to tell the story and helping to do the next thing. And even though we'd gone a little off tangent at some points, it wasn't because we were trying to outwit each other or you know, be resistant to what was going on. It was just we were rolling with, what was happening and finding new opportunities to explore those worlds. And it's nights like those that I'll treasure forever. Yeah, absolutely. We are swiftly running out of time. Yeah. We're, um, we're <laughs> um, I, uh, just really quick. Um, why don't we just briefly point out a, a game that we recommend to someone who's starting out for the first time, either as a player or as a GM, where what's a good game to start with in your opinion? That is a hard question. It is. is, It's really going to depend on the person. You know, if you like, you know, crawling through dungeons, hacking and slashing, um, you know, D&D is probably a good one to start out with. If you like something more science fiction, um, you know, not quite D&D, but, you you know, you want something with some high tech stuff in it. Shadowrun could be fun. Uh, If you love Star Wars... There's several Star Wars yeah. uh, systems out there. I mean, uh, there's the original West End Games uh, version that mm-hmm. I, I played way back in the day that they've just re-released. In fact, I, I, I bought it again. Um, 
That is a fantastic. That makes me so happy. I remember playing that one too. You know, I, I played the the D twenty uh, system of Star Wars. I had. I played the Saga edition. I even have the, uh, you know, the Fantasy Flight version. Um, so if if you love Star Wars, that's a really good one. But there are so many different games out there. Uh, it's really hard to say. You know, that one you should start with. You know, my question would be, what do you like? Once you pinpoint it, say, yeah, I really love Star Wars. Then go look for a Star Wars game. If it's, man, I really love sword and sorcery, you know, Pathfinder or uh, Dungeons and Dragons might be your thing. Or even Exalted. That's a good one. Um, You know, if you want something that has a little bit more flavor and options to it, Palladium. I mean, that's a fantastic series uh, and system. But, you know, you're going to find every system has its own quirks. Every system has its own things. And the great thing is you don't have to use every rule. You know, yeah, you, you as the GM get to pick what you use and what you don't. But once you have decided that, you have to stick to it the entire time. Yeah. So one of the big things for me, honestly, is a lot of people who are considering learning to GM are doing so because they found a game that they like. And even if the game that you're playing right now isn't set in the universe that you want or isn't, you know, tweaked exactly the way that you want it, my recommendation is start with the same rule set and introduce skins right the Mm -hmm. same way that you would paint a new miniature do the same thing with your games Uh, if you need a rule system that's a little more diverse i know we've talked about gurps is a great system genesis is one that's been very popular as well Um, and there are plenty of others that are far more specialized but start with what you know and focus on story first allow the mechanics to follow and as you tell good stories you'll find recommendations from other players as to things that you could try. I, I just thought Absolutely. of another game system. I'm going to jump in here real quick. Gallant Knight Games has a really great series called uh, t- well, Tiny Dungeon. Uh, Tiny, like they, they're just kickstarting uh, Tiny Cthulhu. Um, it's, <laughs> it is a really uh, simplified game system. It is awesome. In fact, uh, I have their mech and kaiju ones. I mean, you get to go around in power mechs and fight kaiju, just like in Pacific Rim. They're not super expensive. Uh, they're they're fairly reasonable, but they're, the rules system, it's definitely more focused on storytelling and having fun. You don't have to use a lot of rules and a lot of rules. So that might be one to start out with because uh, it's pretty simple. It's kind of light. Um, you know, XDM, uh, that's another one I just remembered that is is a fun one. It's very, it's more about storytelling and rules light. So you know, if you're not really into the mechanics, look for those type of game systems. Absolutely, um, I, I think you've both answered the question rather amazingly. So I don't know that I really have much to add there. Um, I, I think we go back to a previous answer of pick pick the the setting. The subject matter or the world that interests you most, the genre that interests you most, um, in terms of like how to get started, I would recommend um, once you know what what system or setting you're most interested in, I would recommend getting your hands on what we call a standard set of polyhedral dice. That'll be a seven piece set, and they range from four sides to 20 sides, which always feels alien and foreign because we're so used to six sided dice. But it's genuine. It becomes second nature so quickly. So get your hands on a seven-piece standard set of dice. Get the core book or the GM's handbook, whatever the case may be. And I would suggest the following progression: um, learn. I, and you can you can feel free to do this in whatever order you you see fit. But I I suggest uh, learn how to build a character. Build a character for yourself, even before you understand the whole system. Just do the process of building a character and don't care if you get it right or wrong, just do your best. Next, learn the system. How is the game played? And then finally, learn the world. Understand what the setting is, the mythos, the various people. And you can do that organically by either starting at the proverbial beginning, whatever they start talking about in their setting description, or if you've had a chance to read through the setting, the one that speaks to you most, that that little portion of like, oh, wow, that those people sound like interesting people. Start there and just tell that story. Get a couple of friends together, play through it. 
maybe build two characters for yourself and have them do combat with each other just to try it out, right? Um, your your first time as a GM does not have to be before a live studio audience. Yeah, and if at any point, or I should phrase it in a, a different way, when inevitably you get <laughs> stuck and you don't know a rule, remember the greatest deception that you will ever have as a GM is pick a number, have them roll a die. And if mm -hmm. it's that number or better, do it. It's okay. Take the time afterwards to look up the rules. Don't feel like you have to be so stuck in the moment that you can't just make the call and help the story keep going. You'll find that you have a better time that way. And you'll also find opportunities to learn those gaps. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the reason we love role-playing games so much is because they are the gamified human experience. And we talked about this a few episodes ago. Um, it occurred to me that in psychology and in uh, law enforcement training, in medical training, in every arena of human life that we might consider most vital, role-playing is a tool that is used to teach us how to be people and how to interact with other people. And so we love role-playing games because they are the human experience. So don't be afraid of it. Don't be nervous. Don't worry about stigma. Just go try it and enjoy it. That's yeah. all the time we have for DCR tonight. That's it. So uh, with that said, we'll catch you next time. Absolutely. And until next time, be epic. Don't suck. I think it's time for Alton to get his own catchphrase. <laughs> We're out of here. Remember, the force will be with you always.